Cool. So, um, yeah, my name is Amy Webster. I'm a second year PhD student in the Jackson lab. Um, and today I'm going to talk about pathogenic invasions onto remote islands. So I'm going to be talking about uh, trees in the present day, but also thinking about the trees in the future. Um, so St. Helena is a small island situated in the South Atlantic Ocean off the west coast of Africa. It has a population of around 4,000 people. Um, it's got very arid land around the coast, um, but in the middle, there is a central peak, and at the top of the peak is um, an endemic cloud forest. So the cloud forest is composed of three main peaks. These are Mount Actian, Diana's Peak, and Cuckold's Point. Within the cloud forest, several endemic tree species exist. Uh, these are just some examples, so the she cabbage, dogwood, whitewood, and black cabbage. Um, however, these trees are now threatened by an unknown disease. This has led to major concerns given extinction events have already occurred, most notably the St. Helena olive, which was fairly recently, um, and several endemic invertebrates. So the black cabbage tree in particular is a keystone species to the establishment of the forest. Um, and the forest is fundamental to carbon sequestration um, and water provision for the islanders. So as well as providing these services, the tree, uh, the endemic forest is also important at providing architecture for other biodiversity to thrive. If a pathogen is present and it's affecting the endemic trees, there's a possibility it can move on to other species within the island and even into the agricultural setting, which the island relies on for production. So the main aims of my project are to identify pathogens associated with the diseased trees um, to improve our understanding of this unique pathosystem. And then this will help to inform management decisions in the future and safeguard the resilience of the cloud forest. So the project can be broken down into several main objectives. Um, the first is to do an initial screen of the microbiome to identify candidate pathogens, monitor changes in tree health over time, focusing on the black cabbage trees, um, exploring the host range of any pathogens that are identified for inoculations, which will then move on to constructing a novel reference genome for the pathogens on the island, produce a diagnostics tool, which the islanders can use to look at presence and abundance of the pathogen with main interest of looking at replanting um, and to monitor the migration of the pathogen through the island with a population genetics study. But for this talk, I'm just going to focus on the first two objectives. So an initial screen of the symptoms, um, we can see the predominant symptoms are sudden dieback, ghouls, root rot and stem lesions. Now, these symptoms are seen not only in the peaks on the endemic trees, but also in the endemic nurseries where the saplings are grown. So the sampling methodology and the monitoring program that's in place is 12 black cabbage trees distributed along the peaks. So when I went to the island, I collected soil, leaf and wood samples, measured abiotic variables such as um, humidity and temperature, looked at the health of the crown, including crown cover and the height of the tree, and then symptomatic variables such as um, leaf discoloration, leaf wilting, leaf drop, and branch dieback. So I then used these scores. I used these percentages and put them into a scoring system to categorize the severity of each symptom. I could then use this to calculate a disease severity index, um, which is a measure of the symptom as for the population of 12 trees as a whole. But when we look at the individual tree health scores over time from April 2022, when monitoring started to January 2023, when it ended, um, we have trees across the bottom and time going up from April to January. And it's really easy to see the changes in tree health over time, particularly deterioration of tree seven and nine, um, where the dark blue is um, no to little to no symptoms and the light blue means the tree is now actually dead. So if we look at the average percentage dieback of the black cabbage trees over this monitoring period, 
we can see large variation in percentage by that to seven and nine as a result of them becoming deceased. We can see that tree four has a high level of dieback, but this has remained stable throughout the monitoring period. So if we look more closely at tree seven and nine, we can see on the left that tree seven um, has a dieback rate of around 30%, followed by a slight, slight episode of recovery before entering an exponential increase in dieback and suddenly until being unable to recover and being declared as deceased. We see a similar pattern for tree nine, where disease dieback um, reaches above 30% of total crown cover. The tree enters a stage of recovery, followed by this, again, exponential increase in dieback, um, followed by complete death. So looking at the symptoms more in more detail in the run-ups to um, complete dieback, we can see for tree seven that 100% of the crown had become, begun to discolor, 50% of the crown had begun to wilt, and over 80% of the leaves have begun to drop. Um, if we look at trees nine, we can see similar patterns where 50% of the crown began to discolor, nearly 60% had begun to um, wilt, and by this point, tree seven is now completely dead. And for trees nine, nearly 30% of the leaves have begun to drop. And this is just a picture of what they look like before they, before they succumb to complete dieback and after. So I also noticed that some dieback events happened for trees 8, 10, and 11, which are sort of situated closely to the now diseased trees, um, which are outside of the typical fluctuations of dieback seen for these individuals. So again, if we look more closely at these, in these trees, we can see that within the space of a month, dieback exponentially increased to around 30%, 40% for trees eight and 10. And then the next month they entered a stage of recovery um, until the dieback level stabilized. It looks like for tree 11, that when monitoring began, this tree had already entered into the recovery stage. So again, looking at these in more detail, just using tree eight as an example, we can see that the leaf discoloration was just above 15%. The leaf wilting was below 5% and the same for the leaf drop. So this may suggest that there is a threshold the symptoms must reach to um, no longer be able to recover. So going back to the sampling structure, so I've got my 12 trees along the peaks. And as well as looking at those trees on their own, we thought it'd be good to look at the health of other black cabbage trees situated close to those. So in the middle, we've got the focal black cabbage tree, and within a five meter radius, we measured the number of alive and dead black cabbage trees that were close by. If we look at this, we can see that in April 2022, when something begun, there was black cabbage deaths around trees one, eight, and seven. Um, interestingly, tree seven at this point had already started developing disease symptoms, but tree eight had no symptoms. Um, the number of clustered dead black cab cab cabbage trees around trees one and eight remained the same, but there was a 10% increase in the number of dead black cabbage trees around tree seven, and um, the development of trees around dead trees around tree number nine, which as if you remember from before, are now dis deceased. So this is showing typical um, symptoms of a root rot pattern. So one question I thought of was, could dieback be um, correlated to elevation? So the two diseased trees lay at some of the highest points on the sampling um, transect. And while there is a slight correlation, um, it's not strong, and we need more. Um, we need more monitoring data for any pattern like this to be recognised. So the last thing we're going to talk about is just the expiration of the pathogen host range, since we have identified two potential candidates for the disease we're seeing on endemic trees. So one of them is a Phytophthora species, 
and we've begun preliminary inoculations in the UK on some flowering plants. Um, this has been done using a rice inoculation method, and the same will be done on the island with the endemic species once the quarantine facilities have been set up. So the idea for the rice inoculation design is we take some agar plugs, we place them into a flask with part cooked rice, we incubate the rice for two weeks. Once the pathogens fully infected the rice grains, we damage the flowering plant roots, place five grains of rice into the soil and observe disease um, symptom development above ground and below ground, such as measurements of necrosis on the roots. So some of the concluding statements, it looks like multiple pathogens are present on the island, given the variation of symptoms that we're seeing, particularly differences in symptoms on the peaks and in the endemic nurseries. Um, as a result of identifying two candidate pathogens, the Phytophthora and the Ileonectria, access to the peaks has now been um, put, the access to the peaks is no longer available, which means monitoring has um, stopped since January 2023. Um, it looks like dieback, oops, sorry, could be correlated with ele elevation, but more monitoring is needed, which can't be done until the restrictions are lifted. It appears the onset of um, death occurs within two to three months of disease development, as long as disease development goes beyond the recovery threshold. And several candidates, as I said, have been isolated and pathogenicity testing is underway. So I just want to thank everyone, my supervisors, Rob Jackson, Megan McDonald, and Mojin Rabai, the postdocs, everyone else in the lab. And I have a lot of collaborators on this project, Cabby and the St. Helena Research Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. If we can have the speakers by the table, please. We have quite interesting questions for you. This is just a reminder to vote for the posters while having lunch. <laughs> So, so we have a few quite a um, few quite questions for Giuliano to start with, and the first question is: Are the niches available for epiphytes similar between tropical and temperature forests, or do we see differences in epiphyte diversity or composition? Um, so. Obviously, there is a, a big in diversity towards the tropics um, and on a few species like in temperate rainforests. Um, in um, New Zealand and Chile, I, I guess it's the most it's the richest um, rainforest, temperate rainforest for epiphytes, but still just uh, a few species. Um, so, in principle, there must be some differences in issues, obviously. Um, and when was the rest of the question? Or do we see differences in epiphyte diversity or composition? Well, yeah. Well, that's in the same question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's another question. Amazing modeling. Have you explored how variation in canopy structure affects epiphyte communities via microenvironmental variation? Is that possible in the model? So it is definitely possible to analyze the emergent results to see once you vary, you, you have to probably conceive a devoted simulation experiment where you vary both microenvironment and the forest dynamics to see the relative impact of those on the emergent patterns of the epiphytes. But um, so it 